Yeah, we should start right at 7.30 if we can. Okay, so if it's 7.25, we should probably put this on for you. Yeah, I got it. I, I put everything. Oh, you're all set? Yeah, I'm all set. So as soon as we're ready, I'll yep, start. Yep, you're online. You're yep. Actually, unlatch it. Unlatch a little button. Yeah, so he just did it for us again. He unlatched it. It's probably the 10th time tonight. And I know. 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 I the which one? No, thank you. Yeah. 
gotten to pick the brains and are going to continue this evening to pick the brains of so many wonderful people who um, are working for gender parity and the parity of the disenfranchised in the theater. Um, some of the people who are with us today who are not going to be here tonight, so I'm going to mention, because I, we were so thrilled to have them join us, uh, Lisa Tierney Keo from Waking the Feminists, Carrie Purcell from Playbill.com, Linda Chapman from New York Theatre Workshop, as well as a number of our organizations, um, Laura Penn and Barbara Walkoff from the staff of SDC, uh, Wendy Goldberg from the O'Neill Center, who is a board member of SDC, Robert Schengen, who's on the Council of Dramatists Guild and started the Women Playwrights Initiative for National Theatre Conference. Randy Reinholtz and Jean Bruce Scott, also from National Theatre Conference. Sherry Eager, who is, oh, and I did not introduce myself, did I? Because <laughs> I can't refer to the coalition until I've introduced myself. I'm Shellen Lubin. I am the co-president of the Women in the Arts and Media Coalition, also on the board of the League of Professional Theatre Women, but primarily a, a theatre artist. <laughs> um, and Sherry Eager is a... Uh, is a special advisor to the board of the coalition and also in a number of these other organizations. Susie Evans from TCG and American Theatre Magazine. Martha Wade Steckaby and Judith Binus, who together did the Women Count Studies and continue to do them for the League of Professional Theatre Women. Um, Anna Landy from the Stateric Foundation. Uh, Marie Spence from um, the Tolman Foundation. Uh, Amanda Feldman from History Matters Back to the Future. There's a lot of work going out, out there on their guys. Marilyn Henry from the Preservation for the Society of Theatrical History. Pat Addis, who's also a special advisor to the board of the coalition and also on the board of Girl Be Heard. If you don't know about these organizations, you should. They're all doing really important work, as are all the people who are about to talk today, tonight about all of the things that we discussed today. This was pulled together this day by myself on behalf of the coalition and Martha Richards on behalf of Women Arts as an extension of a conversation we had in Toronto last spring that was um, brought together by the Canadian Equity and Theatre Movement. We're going to hear from them in a few minutes, too. And um, I am just going to do that much of an introduction and defer to all the people that you're about to be introduced to who are going to talk about all the many things that got discussed today. And Martha Richards, take it away. All right. So I was uh, one of the first ones who got to speak. And my name is Martha Richards. I'm the executive director of Women Arts, which is a nonprofit organization that's been going for 20 years ago. I founded it 20 years ago. It's just long time, <laughs> and our mission is to increase the visibility and opportunities for women artists. So I've written a HowlRound piece uh, and that uh, is part of the series that's running this week in, in conjunction with this gathering, and so Shellen has written a piece for, and several of the other people in the room that will speak later have written pieces for the HowlRound series, but mine was specifically about finances, because I've been, after doing this for 20 years and seeing how all over the country, most of the groups I know that are collecting the data on gender parity have a heavy volunteer component. Nonprofits in general are underfunded, and women's organizations and organizations for people of color or any other marginalized group tend to be even more underfunded than the other nonprofits and understaffed. And so there's a big burden on the people who are trying to do the work and a high burnout factor often. So the question I'm starting to raise is what do we, well, for, there's two things. One is, uh, looking at the statistics on women in theater in particular, most of them have not changed that much in the last 20 years that I've been doing this work. So it's a little frustrating to look back and say, you know, we've done a lot of great work. There's been a lot of women who've been mentored. There's been a lot of individual artists who've moved forward thanks to our help and help of some of the other organizations. But the statistics for the field of the whole remain poor. So I'm, as I'm because I'm now on Medicare, <laughs> as I'm getting older and starting to think like, what can we do to make the field better uh, moving forward? I'm starting. I'm really considering the question of what is it going to take to move the needle. 
Uh, and my own sense is that the, our movement needs to be staffed better. So in my HowlRound article, I posed the question, if you had $10 million to spend on gender parity right now, what would you spend it on? And, uh, <coughs> and the reason I ask that question is because it forces you to think about the infrastructure of our movement. Like, what is it that we actually need to accomplish? What kind of staff would it take? I mean, if, when I was running a regional theater and we were gonna put on a play, the first thing you think about is, okay, do I have enough money to do that cast size and that you know, number of people and how much will the marketing cost? We thought about all that stuff when we would plan the shows, when we plan the season. I don't feel like we're doing that as a movement. And that's what I'd like to see us spend more time thinking about. There's wonderful initiatives all over the country. Or can we pick ones that we think are the most effective, replicate them, pour money into them so that they move forward and up? I, I think that would be the right thing for us to be doing. So in my article, and this is totally, I mean, the $10 million picture, the number I picked because then you could say, okay, you, for that amount of money, often when I ask this question to a crowd, I get kind of dead silence. <laughs> nobody leaps out of their seat, except for Elsa Rael, who had a <laughs> suggestion right away. But usually <laughs> nobody says, yes, here's what you should do with the money. Usually there's kind of a silence, they're thinking about it. Maybe it's too much money to even think about because we never raise it, you know, so. Uh, my own suggestion is, uh, and, and at those same meetings where people can't think of an idea, some, invariably somebody will come up to me after me, some bright, energetic woman will come up to me and say, I would love to spend my time working on gender parity, but I need to, I have kids, I need to get paid, I need health insurance, my rent is really high. So I feel like there's a lot of women out there who are either already working on it on a volunteer basis or who want to spend more time working on it and they can't afford to do it. So my thought is, if we had $10 million, could we somehow set up a network of groups where there would be, maybe it's 100 women get $100,000 each, or 100 organizations get $100,000 each, and they use that money to build our movement and build the infrastructure that we need, so that all over the country, women artists will know, oh, if I have a prop, this, if I want to figure out about legislation, I can go to this group. If, I want to, if I'm teaching a class and I want to have more, um, a curriculum about women artists, I can go to this group. If I uh, am producing plays and I want to find more women playwrights, or if I want to find actresses of a certain kind, or if I want to focus on women artists of color, you'll know how to go. Yeah. Come home. So, okay. So, so I'm, uh, that's kind of my uh, pitch. And so what we talked about today was uh, with a lot of the women in the room had great ideas of things they were already working on, and so we're going to, this evening's forum is sort of to have a brief discussion where they can present their ideas, and we'll talk about them more. In the yeah, we sure will. <laughs> Julie Henricus of Stage Source in Boston. Well, um, I was part of the Toronto group as well, and really thrilled to be part of today and to have conversations. Give you a little bit of background on the work that we're doing in Boston and New England. Stage Source is a 30-year-old service organization, um, celebrating 30 years this year, as a matter of fact. And we have hundreds of individuals and over 200 organizations as members of, of Stage Source. A year and a half ago, we started a gender parity task force. And so we have five different committees as part of the task force, one for data collection, one for, I wrote these down so I can remember, a strategy group, a university group, because Boston has a lot of colleges, you all might have heard that once in a while. And so how are students being trained, how are faculty responding, what's going on in that area, we just sent our survey about that today. An audience <coughs> engagement group, which is actually doing Really interesting work. We have a thing called the Standing O. So um, companies that meet three out of five criteria, and the criteria are a woman playwright, a woman director, um, a woman, uh, mostly women design team, a, a story about women or predominantly female cast get a Standing O. You meet three out of five of those. Um, and we also have a data group. The data group came out with a report last May. But what we're talking about, and what I'm thinking a lot about, because I also teach arts management at Emerson College, so I talk to a lot of students, and I'm thinking about what to do with this next generation and how to inspire them, is that this is a social revolution. And we all know this. 2015, we're not going back, right? And Twitter is not going back to the bottle. Facebook isn't going to never not matter. Change can be affected by an individual more than it ever could before. And gender parity 
that it hasn't been recognized or fixed in my lifetime is just heartbreaking, and it has to stop. And our next generation needs to understand that this isn't just about gender parity. This is about social justice and equity. And it's part of a larger movement about that issue that everyone needs to care about, needs to worry about. Theater needs to and can be the leader in this revolution, but only if we start recognizing that we need to create the change in order to be the leaders we want to see. We can't keep expecting the status quo to be okay. Inequity being a status quo is not all right in 2015. So I really believe that things we want to be positive, the standing O, what state choice does, it's all positive, but the backbone of it is it's a social revolution. I'm really proud to be part of that. Yeah. It gives my life meaning. And I think it's going to give the work we're doing meaning. And I could certainly figure out how to spend $100,000. <laughs> <laughs> I want Martha's idea to be at the forefront of everybody's what? brain. Why didn't we have to talk first? <laughs> it's, it's, but that's what we need to aspire to. Big. Yes. Go big or go home. So that's my two cents. Beautiful. Melanie uh, Brooks. <laughs> Melanie Brooks for New Perspectives Theater, 50-50 in 2020, and On Her Shoulders. So, um, we talked this afternoon about a lot of the issues uh, that many of you in this room have talked about, with, at least for the last 10 years. And those of you who know 50-50 in 2020 came to being in 2009. And yet, within that conversation of sort of rehashing some things or trying again to figure out how do we pull all this together into some kind of cohesive activity, um, Julia, the person who just spoke before me, mentioned this notion of social revolution and the idea for radical change. And I'm all, I love radical change. <laughs> but it reminded me that I sat on a two year um, study group, uh, you know, change initiative of, sponsored by Art New York, the Alliance of Resident Theaters, called Theaters Leading Change. And it was um, right, uh, it was funded by Rockefeller, and it was at, right after the economic, we, the economic downturn, politely, the, the crash. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, to look at, at, at uh, and there was a real call, and there had been for a long time, but the economic situation um, made something actually happen, which was a, a call for a paradigm shift in the way in which nonprofit theater is thought about, funded, and operated. Um, and they hired Arts Action, uh, research, which is a consulting firm that does really very progressive work. And we've worked with Ann Donning, um, Julia's company has worked with Ann Donning, the League of Professional Theater Women is also now working with her. And one of the things that we wanted to look at, I will tell you that there's a report, it was a summary report, called Emergent Phenomena, Report on the Process of Theaters Leading Change. And that's on the Arts Action Research website, you can go read all about it. But the fundamental, the kickoff notion was that the 501c3 model has never worked for theater companies. This was grabbed out of the air by Ford and Carnegie when they were establishing the regional theater movement in the 50s. And the idea that they would create these top-down, corporately structured theaters, that as long as there was a ton of money coming from the government and from those two foundations in particular, could function just fine. Um, we could all have debates about the innovation of the work and sort of what they were replicating, but still, it was a model that could function. Um, but when the money went away, when the compact was broken, and I love that language, uh, which I think you use, somebody used today, the compact was broken mm -hmm. in terms of the funding being available, both by the government and the foundations. Um, it became um, ridiculous for anyone to try to operate unless you were privately funded under the 501c3 model. It is a corporatist structure. It does not uh, in any way uh, show or allow for the many, many ways in which theaters actually operate. And one of the premises that Anne and her um, partner, Nella McDaniel, uh, talk about is theater as an essentially entrepreneurial enterprise. And then for centuries, that's what it was. And then until we got the 501c3 model in the 50s, suddenly it was done. And um, they, uh, one of the other problems that happened in the 80s with the loss of funding was also the idea that there was a serious, in this country, move against the idea of nonprofits anyway. That there was a move to eliminate them, that nobody believed in them. Um, and all that, that was failed, you know, in our for-profit fetish driven, you know, there's a fetish for, quote, small business for profit. That those uh, endeavors are always capitalized, nonprofits are always subsidized. 
So even in the language, we are at the bottom of the barrel, right? And I think too that in we talk about when we talk about parity for women theater artists, we're talking about economic justice and paying jobs and all that. But in reality, certainly in New York, and I'm guessing that it is this way around the country, that women are not underrepresented at the bottom of the strap. In all the non-paying or low-paying uh, <laughs> jobs, it's, it's all women, right? And that um, we are, for all the other barriers that, that, that it hinder women's freedom to really be creative and, and live the lives they choose, whether it's family, children, whatever, um, that we are stuck in this model of a 501c3 corporate-driven um, format that we then have to jump through X number of hoops in order to be able to uh, to get the funding you know, that someone deigns to give us. And that if we were freed up from that model, if we really were looked at as true entrepreneurs, if we were funded in the same way that for-profit small businesses are funded and supported by the government, by uh, hedge funds, and all kinds of investors, that we would see a radical difference in how the work gets done. Mm -hmm. And that and that we could really begin to talk about eliminating the, the economic inequity if we had theaters funded in the same way that small, other small businesses were. Mm -hmm. And so that the report does not get us to that point because it wasn't really the, the, the effort of the two years. But, um, there were two important findings that, that we know just from the theaters that sat in that room. And this was the, the sort of uh, top level of nonprofit theaters in New York, not the big Broadway theaters. Uh, and, the, and the sort of, or the top level of off off Broadway and the lower level of off Broadway, one might be called, but it was all nonprofit. That within that group of people, and there were two groups sitting at the table, there was an enormous range of ways in which these companies operated. Um, flexibility in their structures, in their management, in the way in which they program their season, um, that is not accommodated by the funding rules, right? But they somehow, everyone was managing to do it. And also that um, every theater has a value system for the work that they do. And it is not measured in dollars and cents. It is measured in many, many different ways. And that when we force uh, small theater companies, or even just nonprofit theater companies, to conform to consumer market values, that we miss ninety percent of the story, of the impact, of the of the value added to the community. And we can do all the studies we want on how we know that uh, nonprofit theater is part of the economic engine of New York City. That we know that it the ancillary economic benefits, so even if the theater artists aren't being paid, the restaurants and parking lots and everything else are, we know all that. That's not really getting through. We've known it for a very long time. So in terms of reinventing how we structure ourselves, and then we can then go out and advocate and fight for changes in the way in which funders look at us, changes for the way in which the government looks at us. And, and so this was my aha moment today, was to say, I know this, I've known it for years. I was advocating it, as were many of my colleagues in, in Off of Broadway, long before Art New York decided to do this two year study. Now I had left that exercise severely disappointed that the very first thing that happened after we were done with that was that Art New York put out their funding requirements for the two grants that they give, and nothing had changed. It was exactly the same. It still fell within this very narrow corporatist definition. And so I, um, sort of went on my way, New Perspectives is celebrating its 25th anniversary, this is our 25th season. We have had, from the beginning of our, in our mission is implicit, supporting works by women and writers of color that were all inclusive. Um, and uh, so we just went back to doing the work, right, on the small level that we do. But we have mentored and supported hundreds of women theater artists, uh, many who have been able to go on and do paying work elsewhere. Uh, so this sort of reinvigorated me when Julie brought this up. And so this is my thing for for us, is that we get back to this really, really pushing for big change. Right. <laughs> Next is Sheila Sky from the Associated Designers of Canada. Mm -hmm. So the first of the Canadian interlopers. <laughs> um, I love New York, Canadian cousins. <laughs> so um, I, I'm all, I, I wholeheartedly agree that we need uh, seismic change, <laughs> but until that seismic moment occurs, I'm not content to do nothing, and um, I'm working towards incremental change. And this attitude largely comes from what happened to me in my own career. 
uh, back in 1990, I worked for Associated Designers of Canada in an administrative role. I came back in 2010, 20 years later, as uh, the executive director, and had discovered that many of the chief uh, complaints and roadblocks that the membership had um, were still the chief complaints and roadblocks that the, the membership was still suffering. Um, and uh, I was aghast, you know, that uh, the same organization, which is this year turning 50, in, in 20 years made very few inroads. And um, I chalked it up to the um, perfectionistic tendencies of design artists. <laughs> and that they had been looking for something that would be uh, cataclysmic um, and had overlooked the opportunity for incremental change. Um, and so we decided that we would try and use the collective bargaining process to create um, some gender parity improvements. And uh, what we had noted is that set design and costume design, by and large, take quite a long time to do. Lighting design, sound design, and projection design at that time uh, were quicker, quicker jobs. Um, and what we found was that costume designers were uh, typically the lowest paid, even though their work was on par with the their workload was on par with the set designers who uh, were among the best paid. And when we looked at our membership, we discovered, of course, that uh, not all, but the majority of costume designers were women, and not all, but the majority of set designers were men. And so we went to our bargaining partners, the Professional Association of Canadian Theatre, and again, it was in the height of the, it's not really the height, is it? It was in the bottom of the economic downturn. Um, and we said, we need to make this change. We need to make it in a way that does not destabilize the industry. Uh, putting my members out of work is not my goal here. And so what we agreed to do, uh, and it was ratified by our membership, and I'm so proud of them, uh, is that the lighting, sound, and projection designers took small cuts, small incremental cuts, and over the three years, we walked up the costume designers so that their base was on par with set designers. And we allowed that to happen for a few years, and then we went back to analyze to see what had happened. Because, of course, base fees are not the same as negotiated fees, what artists are actually paid. And what we discovered um, is that, by and large, we had been successful. That Costume designers were indeed being paid now, and sometimes even exceeded what set designers were being paid. Mm -hmm. And then I went back and looked at it not merely by discipline, but by gender. And what I discovered is that not only had uh, female costume designers had substantial increases, uh, but that their male costume designers had had actually the lowest fees of all. And they had uh, had the largest improvement. Mm -hmm. um, and at, at first, the um, it, that was a bit surprising, and then secondly, <laughs> it was a bit disappointing. Until I realized that the other change we had made, so that we could ensure that costume designers were fairly compensated, is that we had made it now that a fee was declared for each discipline. Prior to that, men were typically hired if they were hired as costume designers were hired to do set and costume, and were essentially throwing in costume design for half price sort of thing, because what the heck, you only have to read the play once, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then, so that was devaluing as, as a whole. So um, it was not sort of the total rainbows and unicorns uh, <laughs> scenario that I had hoped for, but that instead of collateral damage, which was the one thing we really feared, that people would stop getting work that would be too much for the theaters, we actually had collateral benefit, and that we had created equity um, based on job description as well as on gender. Um, and we're continuing to look at these on a year-by-year -year basis. Uh, and uh, at this point, the um, slight hit that the uh, three other disciplines took um, they have since managed through negotiations to walk themselves up to the previous level. So with only a short-term mm -hmm. sacrifice, 
they were able to create this long-term change for costume designers. I can't tell you how proud I am. It's so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> And now Rebecca Burton from the Playwrights Guild of Canada and Equity in Theatre is going to talk about, it. there were so many hers as well as so many other research studies that were reported on today. Yeah, so topic of research studies. There have been many now. Australia, England, Canada. We just researched, uh, released our latest one in 2015. And of course, lots going on here in the United States. The Boston Stage Source, the San Francisco Bay, where's the count? Um, all these studies pretty much tell us the exact same thing. So if we look at artistic directors, directors, and playwrights, women account for somewhere between 17 and 25 percent of the productions. So we've heard all sorts of reasons for this. For example, there just aren't that many women playwrights or directors, so of course we see that. So I work for the Playwrights Guild in Canada. Our membership is 50-50. But last year, in terms of our productions, 25% of the plays stage profession in Canada were for, uh, by women playwrights. So we find that uh, artistic directors, directors, and playwrights are on the bottom in terms of representation for women. And again, that this is a global phenomenon. It's uh, not unique to any of our countries. We also found that the stats are much lower, of course, for people of color. So more like 6% in Canada oh. for women of color. Very low across the board. Um, we've also found that the theatre industry is very gendered. So the behind the scenes support roles, dramaturgs, stage managers, general managers tend to be overwhelmingly female, sometimes 70%. Uh, designers, as we have heard, set designers, lighting, sound is the biggest in Canada, 85% male. So there's this real um, imbalance. We've also found that it's completely related to money. So the more money a theater company has, the less the representation of women. And um, typically where women show up the most is in uh, TYA, Theater for Young Audiences, which of course has the least prestige, the least money, um, all that good stuff. <laughs> So, yeah, what else can we say? Um, we've also looked at colleges and universities, because of course these are the training grounds, like why is this happening? And we found, um, at least in Canada, and I suspect that it's similar around the world, sometimes the programs are 70% women and 30% women, especially in acting programs, but the plays that are produced um, are overwhelmingly written by men, even worse than the professional industry. Yeah. We're talking like 10%. So you have these huge populations of women trying to train for theater who get no opportunities, like at all. And then you get out of school and you have no opportunities, and of course it's a catch-22 uh, situation. So uh, then we looked at theater audiences. And again, we find pretty much across the board, depending on the theater and the place, it's between 60 and 70% of your audiences are women. They're buying the tickets, they're going to the theater, but the theaters are not programming for them. Can you imagine what the theater turnout would be if you actually programmed for the people who showed up to your theater? <laughs> no, we'll have to try it someday. Um, yeah, same with, we keep hearing about theaters dying and we're not getting the audiences in, and it's the same with people of color and other marginalized yeah. communities. If we started programming work that actually appealed to other people, perhaps they would come to the theater. Definitely. And that would really change things. Um, so especially, I think it's the same in, in the United States yeah, as Canada, absolutely. that white people are not going to be the majority soon. Yeah. So we need a cultural representation that reflects that fact. And that might help us not only economically, but even the art form, artistically, innovation, fresh blood, all that good stuff. Yeah. So all of these research studies, I mean, they're very important because they, they give us the proof of what we've known all along. So we can say, no, this isn't anecdotal. This is for real. And we really need to do something. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Ramona, Ramona Ostrowski from HowlRound, who has also sponsored this entire gender parity series this week that, that I've curated, that started on Sunday, and Martha's article, and Julie's article, and a few others. Uh, Yvette, uh, who's going to be speaking later, was up today, and it's just a lot of great stuff you should go read if, if you haven't had a chance to see it yet. 
Yeah, absolutely. So we're so happy to, um, to be running this week of content. We're thrilled to be live streaming um, on HowlRound TV right now. Um, and I'll just take a second to remind everybody that all of our platforms are totally open. Um, all of our content comes from the community. So if you guys want to write a piece for the journal, if you want to live stream an event, if you want to put your plays on the new play map, um, go to HowlRound.com. We have the, it's all laid out on our participate page. Um, so that's a great place to, uh, to put your awesome work um, out into the world. Um, so we've been talking uh, throughout the day a little bit about sort of the role of journalism um, in uh, furthering these gender party movements. So we had a representative um, from Playbill here earlier um, who was talking about what, uh, what she's doing. She, um, she has written a lot of uh, content for Playbill about women. Um, specifically on Broadway, uh, and in that community, there was um, a week of content that she curated over the summer, um, specifically about women on Broadway, as well as uh, a long-form piece about work-life balance and raising children um, while being a theater uh, professional, which is um, definitely worth checking out, uh, so that's all on Playbill. And we were also um, lucky enough to be joined by someone from American Theater Magazine, uh, who consistently publishes um, information about gender parity. They recently put out a list of all of the TCG member theaters that had um, parity in their current season. Um, so I recommend you guys check that out. There was uh, a piece that they wrote to a company that where they interviewed the leaders of those companies about sort of what initiatives worked for them um, and what they were doing. So that's definitely worth, uh, worth looking at. Uh, American Theatre Magazine and Paul Ryan actually have both also, in the past two months or so, put out um, some material about a new initiative called the Jubilee, uh, which was started by Kirk Lynn um, down in Austin, Texas, but is really sort of a grassroots um, initiative aimed at getting every theater in the country to, to commit to producing only plays by women, people of color, uh, playwrights with disabilities or LGBT playwrights in the 2020-2021 season. Um, so this is conceived as like a really radical intervention um, to sort of uh, totally disrupt the narrative um, of what we see on stage and spend one year uh, telling the stories that we aren't telling enough. Um, so I recommend you guys check out the material um, on that initiative and consider joining the, uh, the organizing committee because like I said, it's totally grassroots um, and open to anybody to get involved. Thank you. Uh, so next we have someone who, I, the way I look at her, it, her art is her advocacy, and she has been working for so many years as a fierce, fierce woman theater artist, Lisa Volpe. Thank you. So I founded the LA Women Shakespeare Company in 1993, and came out of this whole movement to have women and girls' voices on stage and in the world. And I was kind of mentored into this group by Carol Gilligan and Kristen Linklater because they included me in Company of Women, which was an international company exploring what if the women played the roles the all-male company um, had originally. And I played Henry V. After three years of exploration, that gave me lots of tools. Now, I started my own company about the same time, and I made it a mandate it should be all-female, behind the scenes and on stage, and that it should be no more than 50% white. And so we've done that for over 20 years. And in the last few years, well, gender bending is now trending internationally, <laughs> which is fantastic. And with the support of the Shakespeare Theatre Association, which is a large organization of artistic directors and managing directors that my advocacy work has uh, focused on for over 20 years, because it was an all-white male-dominated organization. Uh, I worked very hard to open up the color lines and also to year after year show superlative reviews, um, mm. excellent box office, international reviews and resonance from a very small room. Always, uh, you know, a little bit like the Wizard of Oz, you know, we can do everything. And along the way, lots of foundations said, look out, Lise, you'll get burnt out. And I said, great, here's another grant application saying I would like to just have $15,000 a year that I could split with one other woman to help in the administrative roles of putting this work forward. Never could get that support. Was told it was a gimmick. 
It's clearly not a gimmick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now we're going back to Charlotte Cushman, and we're going back to Sarah Bernard, and we're, we're going into the past and into the future. So just a word about why I'm putting the yoke down for a while. It may not be the Los Angeles Women's Shakespeare Company in the future, because uh, I wrote a solo show, and I've been touring it around the world, Shakespeare and the Alchemy of Gender, which explains the humanity that is revealed when a person has a great text and is supported by an audience that is wide open and listening. And what happens when that person is resplendently and prismatically heard through a great playwright? Well, more and more and more this is being done. So I'm traveling around the world with this solo show, and what's happening is wherever I go, Indiana, Michigan, London, Vancouver, Ontario, Trans people, ages 14 and 15, are coming out of the woodwork that don't speak gender binary, that are not of that time, that are not white, they are a gender blend of ethnic um, <laughs> celebrity where new people are being born onto the planet. And we owe them a beautiful, resplendent vision for the future. So whether this is the Women's Theater Caucus for Change or um, a bridge towards seeing the humanity and the potential in every person, certainly we have to uplift the situation for women, and especially women of color in this country. Certainly we have to. I think we're all involved in that in some way. Finding funding is essential to preventing burnout both for the older people in the room who have given service for decades under a system where most of us weren't paid anything, and to teach the next generation of young women not to give it away for not free and make them buy the cow. <laughs> so what's happening is now universities all over the country are hiring me to come in because, for instance, NYU has 1,200 undergraduate theater majors, most of which are women. Very few leading roles for those girls, so they invited me to do an all-female production. UCLA had a second-year MFA program that only had one white girl in it. And they only had two men in it. So they hired me to do a gender flip revengers tragedy. Now here's what I want to say about intersectionality. When the men played the women who were raped, they had to stop rehearsal. They had to take a moment and say, I never felt that I couldn't just dominate the situation, punch that idiot out, that I had no tools. Nothing could have humanized those young men more than walking a mile in the shoes of a woman. And the women who were playing the rapists, several of whom had been recently violently raped themselves, were mostly looking for love lines of empathy so they could understand how their loved ones could do that to them. This was my friend, my boyfriend, my, what was that rape? How is he still walking around this campus, my perp, and I'm supposed to be up here, I'm losing my voice. So what I was very impressed by, by the women who gained voice through walking in the shoes of another person, in this case male, it could be Jewish in Shiloh, it could be black in Othello, it doesn't matter what you're playing, as long as you're looking into the eyes of another human being, go, I am you, you are me. Oppressive systems don't work for us. And so we had a bit of a conversation about whether we can at this point even say the word woman without reaching out to our trans brothers and sisters and all the people in between A and B who are being asked at age A, girls to this side of the room and boys to that side of the room, to celebrate the humanity and the potential. And who better than the shapeshifters in the theater world to say anybody can do anything if you put your mind to it. Mm -hmm. So my, my final point about positivity in the world, just not to deny how hard it are that it's like kickboxing to get the work out there, <laughs> but that there is a cycle of woman-to-woman -woman psychological violence that I have been in for 20 years as women rise up and are then pulled down by women, which I think we could all make a difference in. And we like to call that pipeline. Teach someone how to get into the room without being shamed, uh, shut down, or put into a situation where they have no voice and don't expect to get one and therefore don't show up. How many women of color showed up today? How is the value of these panels fructifying in your life? How is it in your bank account? How did it change the mind of your board? 
and get some money to the table so you can write more grants yourself. Do you know what I mean? So I think the more that we really ally with each other, don't uh, distract one another from the bigger picture, which is bridges to humanity that fully include the female voice, the children's voices, you know, the differently abled people, it's one conversation. Theater has three root words. The place where you see God is in all of the theater, theology, therapy. It's all where you see God. So how do you define, what is the spirit of community? What is our responsibility to the planet and to each other to lead a healthier system? What could we do with radical love that doesn't tear down our, our brothers that are also working in the theater? And so I applaud all of us for showing up and you for putting this together. And I do think that uh, the women need more financial support. But first and foremost, they need support at the heart, at the courage level, courage, time of the heart. We have to tell each other, thank you for what you do. It gets better. It's better than it was. And also have really big visions for the future about how we can make a difference. For and the it does generation. make a difference. I'm here to tell you it makes a difference. It makes a difference. It has made a difference. And we are part of our conversation today. So, uh, um, Teresa Lotz, who is a playwright and composer and works for Works by Women, the organization started by Ludovica Villerhauser, who is also here for some of today. So you gave me a perfect segue. <laughs> <laughs> the nurturing at the heart. Um, I'm under 30 years old, if you couldn't guess. And I was so lucky in 2012 to be kind of taken under their wing and to make it here. And if that had not happened, I did an internship with um, BH Theatrical and Works by Women. If that hadn't happened, I, don't, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be sitting here trying to advocate for women in theater. Um, that mentorship relationship was so integral to my success as a human being and my success as a young emerging theater artist. And I fully, fully believe in advocating for every single 20-something-year-old person who's in theater to have someone like Ludovica in their life, someone like Sean, someone like Melody. These people who have taken tons of women underneath their wings and just been like, listen, we're fighting a fight right now, and we need your help, and you're the ones that are going to keep fighting it. It's so important, and it's been so empowering being here, and just thank you for everyone that is making this happen for my generation. I'm going to applaud now. <laughs> <laughs> With that being said, um, I think my generation, we have a kind of in unique fight in that not only is this part of it, there's also this issue of intersectionality that was brought up very eloquently. Uh, we are so imbued with so much information in our like social media age that it's really difficult to separate what's actually a problem and what's people crying wolf, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I personally am really interested in, in trying to see how we can bring all these different movements together. I mean, this year, especially with the Black Lives Movement, and with the or Black Lives Matter Movement, and with the trans movement, um, there have been huge strides forward. And I found, at least in my own circles, a lot of feminists have kind of been afraid of the, embracing those things as part of what matters to us as well. And I think, to, in my opinion, in order to reach the under 30 crowd, we have to embrace those things. Um, and so mentorship, intersectionality, under 30, I think I've everything. Hi. Oh. <laughs> now, before we start the total conversation. There were three people who are here tonight who were not able to be here during the day. So they're speaking for the first time. We're getting to hear them for the first time today. But all three of them are very important. Um, the first one, I can't tell you how much you were talked about today and that the Women's Voices Festival in Washington, D.C. was talked about as a model of what can be done in a positive way. And we're so grateful to have you here, Nan Barnett. <laughs> You know, I feel like a bit of a mealy mouth no. woman now. Everybody, you guys are all so fabulous and wonderful. Um, I come from a, a, my grandfather raised uh, eight girls in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And um, I was about 35 years old before I realized somebody was treating me the way they were treating me because I was a woman. Because I never... 
thought anybody had a choice. <laughs> I was just as important and right as everybody else mm -hmm. in the room. Um, it has led me down some dark paths and some wonderful paths, uh, but most recently, the thing that I have found is that I am I'm thrilled that we're doing all the information collecting and we're putting all of that stuff together, um, but I'm tired of talking. Yeah, right. <laughs> just we're gonna we're just gonna do things. It might not be the right thing. It might not be the best thing. But we're gonna do things. So I was lucky enough to be. I'm um, my day job. My real job is as the executive director of National New Play Network. Those of you who don't know who we are, we're an organization of over a hundred theaters now that do have a dedication to the development, production, and continued life of new works and innovation and implementation for the new play field. And it's been uh, a great joy for me to land there because it sort of syncs up with my whole philosophy. Uh, and we've done a lot of things. But we're going to talk specifically now about what's happened in DC, which is where NNPN is based. Um, a group of the seven largest theaters in the DC market. Um, Arena, Shakespeare, Signature, Studio, Roundhouse, Woolly Mammoth, and Sports. Thank you. <laughs> you think after all this time I can rattle this off. Yeah. Um, those artistic directors are buddies. They're uh, six men and Molly Smith. And they get together on a regular basis. Uh, they're friends and they have a great deal of respect for each other. And they really do, unlike any other theater community I've uh, ever worked in, there's less competition. Uh, at least at that level, of uh, for what's happening in the community. They, uh, a few years ago, had done a small O'Neill festival, they'd done a small Shakespeare festival, where they would, they kind of got together and went, well, let's all do something on this theme. Um, whether they were, had a wonderful premonition, or whether they were just lucky as hell, two and a half years ago, they started talking about gender and women and women's voices and putting that on their stages. Um, about They brought in then a group of other theaters to talk about what they'd be interested in doing it as well. Here's the model. It's actually kind of brilliantly simple. You get far enough out in terms of programming that every theater that wants to participate can program in their own way, at their own budget level, within their own mission, a work by a woman, all of them at the same time. Uh, what actually ultimately happened were there were 58 world premieres fully produced by women that played within a six week period in Washington, D.C. There were nearly that many, again, events, workshops, readings, panels, discussion that happened about gender, about power, about uh, how we are doing the things that we're talking about in terms of who is our audience, what do they want to see, uh, how do we empower students, how do we bring people together to have this discussion, how do we get to the point where we don't have to have the discussion. Um, we are just now gathering all the information back, uh, but in round numbers there were uh, almost 70 female playwrights that had their work examined, looked at, uh, not all of them fully produced, as I said, some of them were in readings. There were more than 50 that had full productions. Um, there were also uh, the staffs of more than uh, 60 theaters worked together on the festival in various ways, and we were able to uh, raise a half million dollars in in-kind and uh, cash that the majority of went right back out into marketing for the festival itself. We were not marketing any of the individual theaters. We were marketing the framework of the festival. Um, we're getting now uh, audience numbers in. We're learning a lot. It is a model that we hope to be able to share. Uh, we hope to see it replicated across the country. And we are really interested in talking to people that are wanting to be a part of this. It was an amazing thing. I will tell you the day that we had 25 of our playwrights gathered together for mm -hmm. the cover shoot for mm -hmm. American Theater mm -hmm. was truly one of the 
brightest moments of my life. I was overwhelmed and didn't know what to do with myself. They were from 17 to 70. They were in suits and pearls and heels and cowboy boots and cut off jeans and purple hair. There were women who had never had a fight produced before professionally. There were women who have had wonderful careers. And they all stood on the stairs. Very but they also just couldn't be stopped from talking to each other. And that, watching that happen, watching those young women talk to the more established writers, watching writers who had seen each other's work for years but never been in the same room together, watching old friends and people who saw each other every day all stand around and talk about the work and what was happening and how unbelievably proud they were to be a part of what was happening. So, pretty special. Wow. Who, uh, whose piece was out today in HowlRound, um, is going to talk for a few minutes about her petition for yes. arts funding being tied to parody. Mm -hmm. Hi, Sean. Hi. I'm Arthur. Hi. <laughs> Hello, Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Um, So my name is Yvette Heiliger. I'm a playwright and a producing artist, and primarily a citizen artist. That's what I call myself, a citizen artist. And I figured out early on that I had a dog in this fight for parody. Um, I didn't know it. I started producing my own work just because I thought it was sexy and fun to do. And uh, I had no idea that I really had to be producing my own work <laughs> <laughs> until much later, you know? When I started seeking other opportunities and finding that the doors were not always open and, and the environment was not always hospitable for me. So I'm fine. I, I went about it, produced my own plays. I'm publishing a book of my plays just because I don't want to leave yeah. the earth without someone knowing I was here. So um, this is my second book of plays that I'm publishing. And I encourage all women to publish. Mm -hmm. um, but um, as you've heard from uh, my, my Caucasian sisters already, we get less than half of the opportunities of, of, of our white sisters. And, um, you know, that's, that's not a new story. I'm the only African American person in the room, and I think that's pretty representative of, our, of how we show up. I don't know where we are. I don't know why. We don't realize the dog we have in this fight. Sometimes I think that people are just fighting for what they've got, and they don't want to jeopardize it by stepping outside of it to, to fight for others. I don't know what the situation is, but um, when pre President Obama was elected or re-elected to office, that was a blessing for my life in terms of this movement for gender parity. I learned all about community organizing, how important it is to fight for legislation, existing laws, protecting existing laws, changing laws, maybe amending the Constitution. We uh -huh. talked about the ERA too. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Um, so I sort of found my voice and found a way to make a difference in this movement through community organizing and through fighting for change. I'm a member of Organizing for Action, and it's all about fighting for the issues that we all care about. And it doesn't matter if you're Republican, Democrat, and it doesn't matter. You know, you're fighting for the issues that the people around you care about. So those are skills that I would like to bring to the table in this fight. Um, particularly the, the, legend, the uh, petition. You know, I went on whitehouse.gov and I was like, oh, a petition, you know, I, I'll write one. And I, and I composed and put together a petition uh, for women, fighting for women. And, um, uh, for legislation, and the petition wasn't perfect, but with the help of the League of Professional Theater, we got 719 signatures from all 50 states. And I thought, oh, wow, this is great, it's very encouraging, at least we got all 50 states. <laughs> so when I went to Canada, um, I said that the one thing that I would do would be to do a new petition, and to also look for precedents that would help us to fight uh, for, for the funding and for gender parity. And uh, it was Gloria Steinem 
who sent me an email said, well, what about Title IX? What about this? What about that? You know, so she started putting ideas in my head to look for, for things that have already happened. And uh, so, so now I'm at the point where I found out about comply or lose your funding. That's oh it. my God! That's what a revelation! That's what I have I heard about comply or lose your funding? Maybe because it's rarely enforced. Mm -hmm. But I think we can hold the feet to the fire. We can. Um, I can't remember the exact wording in how around that, I wrote, <coughs> but basically that we would fight for legislation that would make um, parity for women. Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That we would uh, enjoy the rights of other protected groups. Yeah. And that we would um, fight for legislation that included us, and that uh, organizations that do not comply would lose, lose their, their funding. Yes. I think, you know, that's really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, anyway, I guess, I guess that's it for me. <laughs> um, I'm a member of the League of Professional Theater Women, 5050 in 2020, <laughs> the Women's Initiative of the Dramatist Guild. You know, I just went and looked for my sisters in this fight so that we could support each other. And so I feel like I've been sort of growing up a little bit and, awesome. uh, through it all. So. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. <laughs> who's going to speak now and then we're going to, anybody can talk, um, is actually the newest initiative. It's, it's, it's so new. Some of you may not even know about it yet, though many of us were on a panel for it just a couple of weeks ago, the Good to Go Festival, Cape Camerata. Oh, there you are. Yeah. I'm looking all over for you. It's I'm the newbie. I'm the newbie. Yeah. Thank you so much for yes. inviting us. Um, right, you're the new kids on the block. It's a real festival. Um, it was founded by our founder and producing artistic director, Judy Zachi, who would have loved to have been here tonight, but she's traveling, she's on the road. Um, she had this vision of getting a, a producing platform. And so all of these wonderful initiatives that are out there to actually put them together and try to get producers on board to make um, readings and actual productions happen. You know? Yeah. So um, she called me on board. So I'm the festival producer and the literary manager for Good to Go, which is really, really exciting. You know, as a female theater artist, as a producer, and as a teaching artist as well. And um, the DC Women's Voices has been um, really inspiring to us, as that, I guess everybody else in the room. So we would like to replicate then what you've done on a, um, a national level. Oh, all right. So that's really our idea. So um, the kickoff summit that we just had two weeks ago was an incredible success. We had over 160 people attend, and. Um, which was dynamite because, as you guys all know, if you claim the problem, claim it and claim it, and there's recognition, and then this community that we're all forming, community creates opportunity. So, I like what you said, we all know, you know, the problem. Well, now we're actually getting the engine and making it go forward, which I find really, really um, exciting. So, we're a producing platform, women producers, although if guys want to produce, we're not going to tell them not to participate, come on board. But um, to be like, uh, Judy calls it a shopping mall of curated work that's good to go and ready for full production. So we're going to sponsor readings and we're going to invite different theaters. Um, some of the ones on board already are like the public, um, Denver Center, National New Play Network, and um, to actually get these across the nation and full productions. You know, because if you don't have women producers or any producers, what happens to your script? It stays on your hard drive and it never sees the light of day, right? So that's what we're trying to do. And I also teach um, theater arts at Stony Brook University out on Long Island, which is why I could be here today. And I have a lot of women, young women, um, in my classes. And often at graduation, they'll introduce me to their parents. And they'll say things like, you know, you're such a role model because I keep telling my parents that I can have a career in the theater 
and have a family, because I have children, and everybody knows I have children because I'm always talking about them, right? Well, little do they know, and it's like, yeah. Because you know the obstacles. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. The obstacles that it's very difficult. So um, I want to do this as much for you know this next generation um, as for all of us and for the future. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. So anybody who would like to talk is welcome to talk, and we'll get you first, then else. Um, but I'm going to ask you uh, to come up here. Can we walk you up here I to talk? Over there. Sure. Good. Because well, uh, we can even help because um, I want to make sure that you're uh, in the live stream. And if you want to ask a question of somebody who's already spoken, we can easily stand up, get two people sitting, however we do it. But I'm going to try and keep all of the people who are talking to this end to so that yeah. what? Should I bring another chair? No, 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 how do you like that? Yeah. This is Elsa who started, founded the Women in the Arts and Media Who also founded, when she was given a grant by CAPS many years ago, decided to give the money back to other women and did a play festival, which I associate produced for her, the Professional Older Women's Theater Festival at the Public, which uh, Joe Papp helped sponsor. And yeah, so she's, uh, she's been doing this work for a long time. Okay. A long time. As a matter of fact, I was delighted that Ludovica has uh, mentored a young woman. I think that, that is actually wonderful, Teresa Locks. So yay, hooray. Uh, uh, but one thing that has not gotten mentioned at all is ageism. Now this is a big thing for a lot of us. I mean, I just turned 88. I mean, I am. Birthday two weeks ago, 88. I can't believe it, even mm -hmm. myself, but I am 88. Um, I find that even the plays that are done have as central character uh, uh, not a woman of age, but a, a side character's grandma or mama, but the central character is not a woman of age. The, the program that we did at the POW Festival, this, this is worth a million <laughs> coins of gold, <laughs> uh, was the central character had to be a woman over 50. The central character. I thought, well, we'll get 12 plays. Mm -hmm. We got 225 plays. Wow. Now, we did get I'd say about 20% of them were women with shopping bags. <laughs> okay, shopping bag women are okay. Uh, <laughs> these were not shoppers, these were bag ladies. <laughs> bag ladies. <laughs> the central character uh, was a shopping bag woman. At any rate, uh, we were able to get uh, put on, what, over 33 plays? Mm -hmm. Half the public. I want you to know the audience was 99% women. They adored the work. They really, really, they understood what it was about. And uh, uh, Sholin had a play in it. I had a little 10 minute thing in it. It was just, it was a wonder. Please, when you're writing your plays, think, think in these terms too. This is this is incredibly important. It's another because, piece of the intersection. Right. I understand how many women, I can't even begin to understand how many women have just given up mm -hmm. because they cannot get roles after a certain age. They just, they just are not there. I was at a, a staff party uh, after a production at Queens College where I got my master's, and this woman, uh, who was the, the wife of the producer, knew every song, got up and performed them beyond, beyond beautiful. <laughs> I said, why aren't you working? She says, well, she says, I'm 45. <laughs> I said, what does that mean? She says, it's no work for me. So what are you doing? She says, I'm studying computer to get a job. 
this is where what's happening with the older women who can't get work. They are, they have to give up their work. Please, think in terms of ageism. It is such a, a heartbreaking, heartbreaking issue. And thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. I um, am from Brooklyn, so I managed Manhattan Theatre Schools for a couple of years, from which um, Astro Genius was the main surviving legacy. Mm. And um, after that, I started working with the International Women Artists Salon, which is a multidisciplinary international organisation that provides numerous platforms for women um, in all the arts. And with them, uh, we do a, a weekly radio show, which I normally host this evening. So I escaped, I was a bit late, so sorry about that. Um, but that is a, that's a great platform for um, helping people to talk about their work and um, you know, engage with other women artists. It's very energizing and um, very positive. The founder is Heidi Russell, hopefully, hopefully she'll be here after the show to to meet with people. Um, we've also started doing an annual event called Salon Symphony, where we, um, yeah, we, we get, because obviously New York is a very international city, and we get different women from as many different countries as possible to represent the work of a, of a more well-known woman artist from their the homeland that they choose to identify with on International Women's Day. And we've been doing that um, for the past four years in different venues. We're doing it this year in Dixon Place. In 2016, we're doing it in Dixon Place on the main stage. That's going to be our biggest um, mounting so far, if that's the right word. Should we talk about a mount? And we also, in 2012, we started doing an event called Creative Lounge, which was a day of um, promoting the health and wealth of women artists. Again, it was multidisciplinary, but we provided performance platforms for women. We had a, a gallery show. We had um, kind of a, a maker's fair. We had workshops, again, to, to help women to, um, to, to present their work and to share ideas and to, um, and to learn new things and skills. And we're doing that again in 2016 on April the 3rd, which I think is around support women artists now day, which is normally yes, this is she's Swan Day. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to try and do it on Swan Day. We've, we've, we've not decided on the venue yet. It might well be at Dixon Place. Um, so yeah, so we're, we're wow. Um, and part of, the, part, part of the reason I only found out about this yesterday, thanks to Vika, um, is because Astro Genius um, has reached mm. crossroads because their original the executive director kind of stepped down, so they had a, a slight vacuum in, in who was running the organisation. So I was thinking, you know, that's an opportunity to maybe rethink what Astro Genius does, because Astro Genius was founded as a short play festival, an open submission short play festival. But, but I was just thinking in New York, it's kind of crazy that there is no broader women's theatre festival. You know, we have, a, we have a fringe festival, we have various queer festivals, we have clown festivals, we don't actually have a festival of of women's theatre and, um, and I, I saw the American Theatre edition about the what's going on in Washington and of course it was enormous debt exciting and I was like why isn't that happening in New York because there are so many great women's theatre companies here that should collaborate. I think again in a conversation with Vika we realised that there's lots of people that are doing the same thing and you know we're all chasing the same audience, we all have the same limited resources so we should be working should together. Be together yeah. yeah well that's I mean this whole thing was for Martha and I was about bringing people together to learn from each other, to coordinate each other, to connect each other up so that we can continue the conversation and find ways to support each other's work and replicate each other's work and coordinate and publicize each other's work. That's great. It's great. I love it.
faked idea, okay? <laughs> okay. But, but Martha was saying how, you know, what if one had ten, you said million, right? Yeah. <laughs> do that exercise for myself yeah. because sometimes it's not about the money right? <clears throat> you know and so you were saying one option would be X amount of companies hundred thousand dollars each yeah. and I'm actually wanting to think about it in a slightly different way which is why I said it's a half-baked idea okay. because it only came up from what you said okay. it's a beginning it's a beginning, it's a beginning right. of an idea I actually think what many of us need is a structure mm. yes it's money but it's a support system yeah. and a structure and sometimes it's space. So if this supposed wonderful amount of money that we can imagine, and once we imagine it, guess what, we can make it happen. Yes. But I also feel that you can only do that if you have an idea behind it. So if there is a space, if there is a support structure, administrative help, yes. you know, the marketing, you know, the, the, the space where you could do a radio show. I mean, the 100 million yeah, initiatives. Space, office space. All of it. Yeah. But also the administration, because yeah. that's where we yeah. all fall short. We're all trying to create websites. We're all trying to do the social media. We're all running around like crazy God knows what, trying to do a 100 different things in our little corners, as Jenny was pointing out, which is also one of the reasons you said to put this whole Yes, and absolutely. The Canadian Initiative and all everything that's going on. But if there was a central place, how we all plug into that, I don't know. Because of course some people don't want to be involved in something that has a say. It's like your company maybe is big enough that you don't need that. You know? But I but I know a lot of the initiatives in this room were duplicating efforts. Yeah. yeah. You know, and we're exhausted. I don't I know I am. And oh, I know yes. most of Oh, yes. You know, because we've all had this conversation, right? Yeah. And also, if we want to effectively mentor people, we need structure. So, and also with structure and organization and lots of people, we have something called power. Because that's where the power comes into place. It's in numbers. You know, what is it? United we stand, whatever it is we fall. I mean, right? right. right. Yeah. That's that's a cool. I'm too concept, okay, darling, I don't do details. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I'm talking about. It's a concept. And I think if I this could come out of what yes. today was about, I think we would have achieved an enormous mm. amount. Yes. And maybe that's the next step in the conversation. I'm going to go to make a place for melody. <laughs> so, the um, study that I had talked about, the, the working group, the two year theater leading change, one of the ideas put forward in that, and so there's been some preliminary work already done on this idea, which is shared infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And that is companies that, that collectively, you know, individually, no one can afford a real managing director an executive producer, a casting department, a publicity, whatever. And that if you had like-minded companies either with similar missions or people who could get along well, that there would literally be a shared infrastructure. Now the space idea it's goes, fabulous. and so there's some preliminary information, and of course the person that already did some of this work is Ann Dunn, whose name right. has been mentioned. We'll have to tell Ann how many times you're That's right. right. You will. She can watch. Uh, yes, <laughs> she can. we need to yet again. Um, and But the space idea, I think, is also really critical, a huge, you know, the, the, yeah. the, but I came to New York in 1979 as a student at the Women's Inter-Art Center, and Elsa, you know, no, I don't know, Marla Lewis, Lewis, right, of course. Marla Lewis, but it, was the, it well, is the building course. that is right over there, yeah. that is now barely functioning, uh, 10 stories, and the idea behind that was it was women theater artists, there was a gallery, there were silkscreen artists, mm -hmm. I studied um, integrated media arts there, uh, there was a whole program, and again, they didn't have the money to, to, to make it so, and Margo was fighting an uphill battle, and in the fight with the city over actually keeping this property, um, and she had a, a, a plan for exactly this, subsidized rehearsal space, there was a theater there, $18 million from HUD, and the city fought her, she spent the last 20 years in court, mm -hmm. yep. not being in right, the, the bill right she spends so time. Where she spent all the time, and so, 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 I think it's an idea that has come around again, and there's a building sitting right there that is 10 stories. Occupy. What? <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it doesn't have to be. 
the, the ninth and tenth floors are still there. Some of the other people that have come in there. But there's also space at the end of the block that um, the, that Art New York has a theater opening. And also there's there's a lot of space around. And to, to we have no spot for it for women. It's theaters. incredible because you know these we work kind of spaces that yes. exist now. Yes. Can you imagine where we would all could all be around a conference yes. table, a common conference and table? And their own because suite of offices, so when you needed to be on your own, you could. Yeah, but we because have one of the things that we recognize today is that these initiatives are all different, and we need them all. They're right. all doing different things. They're coming at the problem from different directions, and um, and it's. But that's an extraordinary idea. Yes, and the preliminary work has already been done. Yes. Wow, incredible. That's good. Wow. That's good. Yeah. And I, actually, since you brought up Margot Lewitton and Elsa's yeah. here, I say that the next play she was about to produce when everything fell apart was Elsa's play. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. Women Arts actually started as a grant writing work. Like I, oh, when right? I, yeah. when I started Women Arts, I didn't have any resources particularly, so, but I thought, what if I created an organization that would do grant writing service and other kind of financial management stuff for uh, theater companies run by women in my region of Western Massachusetts? So for the first 10 years or so, that's what we did. We had about a dozen companies. We picked women that we thought were really talented, and then we just wrote endless proposals for them. But it was very hard to get funding for that year after year. I mean, the, like it was working great, but we couldn't persuade the foundations to support us to continue doing it. So we had we kind of shifted our But now maybe. now maybe. Now maybe. Yeah, we were actually with that before uh, there, we actually I'd gotten the idea for that partly from uh, I think we worked for Lawyers We Arts in, in California, uh, where we provided free legal services to artists. I thought oh, free grant writing would make sense. But also there was a group called Pentacle in New York that was doing dance. Yes. Dance uh, dance that was the that was the model that Anne and referred us to when we oh, were yeah. ten uh, years ago. So that used to be possible uh, to do and to get the funding for, and then it wasn't. <laughs> so uh. so uh, we have a few things similar to that um, in Canada, and I would encourage you to go look at these models and keep what you like and throw away what you don't. Mm -hmm. um, so Adapt. Yes, yes. So we, um, we had something called the Small Theater Administrative Facility, which was uh, subsidized by uh, the Provincial Arts Council primarily. Um, which uh, was a service hub and it provided uh, publicity, grant writing, financial management, um, and then also had a board room where you could meet with your board. Uh, they would provide minute takers so you could participate fully in your own meeting. Oh, nice. um, and uh, uh, we had something similar also uh, called Duo, which was the dance umbrella of Ontario, which did the same for the dance world. In terms of creating collective space, we have a few initiatives. We have the um, Center for Social Innovation, which is a mixed model. So uh, it, it makes money, but it also provides a, a meeting space below standard market cost for nonprofit groups. Um, some of them arts, some of them other types of groups. Um, and recently, they have begun purchasing buildings, um, and they do it by uh, selling community bonds. So these are like regular bonds. Uh, the interest rate is a little bit lower than what you could get if you were to go to a bank or a corporate bond, um, but it creates this infrastructure, which again is a shared workspace. And then the last um, uh, organization you might want to investigate is Artscape. And Artscape has a history of taking uh, disused buildings and refitting them, historical buildings, sometimes entire regions in Toronto. Um, um, an old abandoned distillery area was refitted and now houses three theaters and homes about maybe 50 artist groups in something that has become um, a hub for the city. Yeah. It was uh, rocky and uh, not easy to do. Um, mm -hmm. Where a lot of the money is coming mm -hmm. for this type of initiative is um, from uh, condo developers. Mm -hmm. uh, Toronto has a huge condo boom. Very often they want to uh, uh, build their condo a little higher than they're supposed to, and in order to get the concession, they have to provide community service space. Uh, recently, um, 
a condo did not alter their plans any, but assisted a theater company in retrofitting a Carnegie Library into housing a community cafe, a gallery, and two theater spaces, as well as uh, theater offices. So, so I would, I, I would encourage you to go and look yeah. at these. I would say that none of them are perfect, um, but uh, certainly, uh, if you're trying to convince people that something is doable, showing that it has already been done can yes, be really useful. What's the name of the first one again? Small Theatre Administrative Facility. They are currently changing their model to become more of a producer's training hub. They're not providing those services anymore. Um, so uh, this is it's currently in the state flux. Um, how it'll all shake out, I can't, I can't know at this point. Exactly. Thank you. Um, exact same topic, just one more initiative in um, Canada that might be of use. Uh, there's a group called CIPAMO, stands for Cultural Pluralism in the Arts Movement Ontario, and they just released a study called, if I can get it right, um, Thinking Collaboratively, Acting Collectively, and it's all about shared platform resources. It's specifically geared towards Indigenous and uh, they call ethnocultural artists. But a uh, brand new study, lots of ideas about this because we're trying to do the same thing in Canada with the same problem. Tell them about Jane's study too at Metcalf. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. So, there was also previous to the Sipamo study, the first step was uh, Jane Mars. Yes. That's her name. And she released a study for uh, the Lower Foundation that was very similar uh, shared platforms. I haven't read it. I can't speak to it anymore. Oh, that. Oh, so, uh, it's, the, it's the Metcalf Foundation. It's online. Go, go read it. Yeah. All right. So just lots right. of resources. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So this is another way we're all working on some, some the same. We're in the same place. Yeah. I just want to address that because there actually are dozens of initiatives like that in New York. Um, but not specifically around women's. Not even, there's nothing that's just for women, women, right? Yeah. But there's a ton of stuff happening. Uh, right down the road, the uh, Hudson Yards, right? It's going to be like a whole new city. And there's an enormous amount of art space available. Downtown, after 9-11, there was a tremendous amount of money put into that. But what happens, this neighborhood, right, there's a lot of preserve, there's Irish Art Center, that's what 53rd Street is about, is that there's a number of theaters that are put into the bottom of that luxury building. But the main problem with all the initiatives so far is that the companies that are benefiting from that are the larger companies. They have the money to sustain the spaces once they get them. And they're beautiful spaces. But they are not, they're, they're, they really are above where, where I think most of us are. Um, and it's not a collective sort of under one roof kind right. of thing. We do have Art New York, the Alliance of Resident Theaters, but they are moving more towards what you said, which is they've always been about making us into good little model 501c3 organizations. Mm -hmm. They are not, they do not support the creation of the art. It's actually sort of not even in their mission because they don't want to be in a position of judging their members' output. Um, and so the, there's the League of Independent Theater. I think we should in, in, be involved with them. Amanda, who was here earlier, that was a new initiative that came about about six years ago. Is someone here? I'm here. Oh, and Eddie, you are here. Yeah. Right? How long has it been going on? Uh, uh, 2011. Yeah. Was Which was also trying to create a new model, right? You for independent. And you should, you could yeah. talk about that. Yeah. We should get them involved. But they're also trying to do some real estate stuff as well, yeah. right? And there is, the last thing I'm going to say is NIFA, the New York Foundation for the Arts, used to do the administration, but for individual artists, right? They were funded by right. Rockefeller and right. for small theater companies. They stopped doing that a long time ago, but they were a centralized admin resource. Yeah. Uh, just to uh, speak. What's your name? Hi, I'm Amanda Feldman. I'm here with History Matters Back to the Future. Um, so let me talk about that, and then I'll transition into Lit, which is what Melanie just mentioned. Um, Melody, sorry. Uh, the History Matters Back to the Future is an organization that uh, is very young, and our mission and what we're doing is uh, focusing on historic women's plays, play, right, plays that were produced prior to 1960, um, because when you look back, uh, mm -hmm. we have many, many foremothers, and uh, their work is not being recognized or celebrated, and these are not 
you know, plays that were like written in a basement that no one ever heard of. These are Pulitzer Prize winning Broadway productions of plays that are just not being recognized and included in the canon and in anthologies. So we have a number of initiatives. At the moment, the organization has been focused on at the university level. Uh, for those of you who heard me speak earlier, my apologies for uh, recapping. But uh, the first initiative is called the One Play at a Time Initiative, where we're asking professors from across the country to dedicate one class period per semester, regardless of the class, whether it's an acting class or a directing class or a theater history class, on a historic women's play. And there are you know, dozens of hundreds. Um, and then in addition to that, as a almost a motivator to get professors from across the country to participate and to encourage the further study and engagement with these works for students. We've created uh, an award that we call the Judith Barlow Prize after Judith Barlow, who was a professor at SUNY Albany and who has written three anthologies now of these incredible plays. Um, but it's a $2,500 prize given out to a student for a one-act play inspired by the work of a historic playwright. Uh, we gave our first Judith Barlow Prize out this past May to uh, a student of, from Northwestern University, Selena Fillinger, and she had studied Machinal and uh, wanted to take that on, so she created a play, a one-act called uh, Three Landings on a Prior Escape, and it, it was beautiful. Uh, so in addition to receiving the $2,500 prize, her professor also receives a $500 prize as a thank you for introducing this to your students, and we have a $1,000 runner-up prize as well. But uh, we flew Selena in from Chicago to New York City, and we did a reading of the play, which we streamed on HowlRound, uh, and uh, Kathleen Schalhoff directed it, and I got a handful of Broadway actors to act in it. Um, and it was a really, really special afternoon. It was Sunday matinee time, so it was a very special afternoon for Selena and for all of us. And we are so thrilled that the deadline for the Barlow Prize um, is coming up, and we can't wait to see what's submitted. Uh, so we're really excited about that. And history matters, and you know, I just feel like another. Uh, it's been so inspiring all day to hear about all the various initiatives that everyone is working on, and I just. I'm excited to be part of an organization who has like this little niche off to the side, um, especially since in my day job um, I'm almost exclusively working with uh, living clearance, um, which is a nice sidebar. And as an independent producer in New York City, mainly working downtown, I was a member of the board of the League of Independent Theaters, which Melanie mentioned, um, started around 2011 by a gentleman named John Clancy. Um, and a few others, and it, um, its mission is unlike <coughs> our work, which is a 501c3, I believe, in yeah. itself. This is a 501c6, and uh, their mission is uh, exclusively advocacy. And so government advocacy, um, real estate advocacy, and actors' equity advocacy, because uh, with the independent theater world, we're mainly working with the showcase model, which is governed by actors' equity, and there's a whole slew of complications on that end, which I won't speak about here. But in terms of real estate, um, we have been able to secure spaces from corporations that are not using them and have created a rehearsal space grant out of it mm. uh, through the league, which has been really, really exciting. Uh, we've, uh, and then the League of Independent Theater spun off to do something called the Lit Fund. So we collect and make, we ask, independent theaters and any theaters who participate, who can participate, to donate a nickel for every theater ticket spent, and we brought together a fund, and with it we're doing a whole bunch of, um, or they're doing some like big think grants to organizations who have big ideas to support those moving forward, um, and it's, it's exciting. Um, I know one of the problems with real estate here in New York is that it is often cheaper for a corporation to let a space go empty than it is just to tax right off. Mm -hmm. um, and then also in terms of occupying space is there's a lot of insurance yeah. questions and a lot of and uh, an individual's part time level it's really hard to absorb which is why the cost of maintaining a space in New York is really really difficult without the overarching um, structure or a much larger organization. 
There was also a community board initiative around theater space. Do you know about that? Could you talk about it since you're in that chair? Right. right now? Yes. <laughs> uh, the there's there are a lot because of the condo development, which is I'm tying things back. I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's, it's important. Um, I'm missing things as I go along, but the. There are spaces whenever a condo wants to build higher that the community spaces, I'm assuming such as this, exist. Um, but the city did a really terrible job of creating a database of where they are. So a lot of them have gone missing or empty or being used for we're not sure what. So um, there was talk at one point in time to, to put work into tracking those down. Um, but I do not know where that. Well, that's the theater is. subdistrict fund. Is that what you're talking about? No, uh, the subdistrict fund had to do with. Um, I thought that had to do with rights, uh, air, rights. air rights in the Broadway district. Uh, in the Broadway district. So that's different. This is just for the real estate developers who built those extra ten stories and then put a room in the basement and no one tracked it. So um, wow, it's, uh, is there a way to track it? I think there is. There was talk about. Um, one of the city council members in terms taking up that project. I've since left the board of lit, uh -huh. so I've kind of lost track of it. There is a database of affordable housing, because that, that's kind of integral to new right. builds, isn't it? And there is a database of that, which the Actors Work Fund has right. information on. Apartment. Right, yes. but this is a database yeah. of the yeah, community spaces community. that were created when builders yeah. were allowed right. to go higher. It's slightly different. And they should be available to arts organizations to use, but nobody knows where they are or right. if they were ever really created. Well, I mean, we got right. here tonight because Melody brought us this here. This is a community yeah. space. This yeah. is a community space, and thank you, Melody, Melody for us. opening it for yeah. us. It was great. And I just want to shout out that uh, Stephen Bergman at New York Classical Theater has had a donor buy uh, risers and uh, portable lighting on scaffolding, and he's already made a deal for pop-up Shakespeare that's going to oh, keep cool. his organization, which does free Shakespeare in right. the parks, open throughout the year. Yeah. And he's getting for free open spaces from real estate projects that are temporarily empty, wow. already done. So if we needed a mentor, I'm sure Stephen could My daughter interns help in that way. <laughs> Because you know, real estate is expensive and it's sitting empty. And that's if you have fabulous. a vision, what he does have is portable track lighting and scaffolding. And that kind of shared research, as we talked about women's buildings and shared resources, are key. You go, okay, I need the truck with the scaffolding and the seating and the porta potties to show up here on this day. And it's already one group of things that all theaters would probably need, you know, wow. from, from soup to nuts. And speaking of that, I would actually like something else that did not come up today, but was almost touched on when we were talking about younger audiences and getting them back into the theater. The other flip side of that is getting theater into other spaces, which I think is also really, really critical in terms of how we keep the theater vital in the world now. And so just throw that out, because I don't think you know, we have time or the mind space to address it, but I think it's part of this conversation also, which is where can theater be? Where can it go to get to people who don't normally go to the theater and don't realize how relevant the theater is or could be to their lives? Do you want to talk? Yeah. Come. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about action steps, and I wanted to <coughs> explain the structure that was created around women's voices. We were talking about structure. Good. Um, and not that it will work in every case, but just to share how it came to be. Mm -hmm. um, it's modeled a little bit after National New Play Network's structure and how things get done there. But uh, specifically for Women's Voices, those seven artistic directors who were part of that initial conversation got together and they agreed to each put $5,000 into a pot. Now that's a lot of money for a lot of smaller companies, but it could be $50 into a pot, whatever. And that was the money that they used to then say, how are we going to do this? What is it going to be? How's this going to work? And they hired uh, my then partner at NNPN and I, we created a company called Flanagan Theater Projects in honor of Al Flanagan. Uh, and uh, we then began to talk with them about 
what that structure might look like, what the framework of the festival looked like, and what it was going to take to get the work done, because they're often two very different things, right? So what we came up with was a three-tiered system that had those originating theater artistic directors serving as our governing board. Um, there was, a few months into our tenure, a bit of a coup where the managing directors came in and said, okay, enough of you guys saying what we're going to do, let us get in here. So that, that governing board became 12, because two of the theaters have managing director, producer directing, uh, single acts. So those 12 people became our system. We then created task forces for marketing, for development, for programming, <coughs> and for education. And each of those seven theaters gave us the head of their own department mm. to serve on that task force. Mm. Right? Could you say what the four task forces were? They again? were they were development, right? Did the fundraising, uh, programming, which was in charge of all the ancillary work happening around the festival, mm. marketing. Obvious, yeah. Uh, and education, which was a group of education directors who came together to talk about how we could have the festival have an impact, uh, both for younger and for older audiences through continuing education. Yeah. Um, then those task forces, as needed, as so there were, would have been seven people originally in that task force. They then determined whether they wanted to expand or contract, depending on the workload. So at certain points, other marketing directors from the other theaters were invited in to parts of it. At certain points, they narrowed it down and said, these three people are going to make the decision. But those were teams of like-minded professionals from all different stratas, everything from the theaters that were basically being created specifically for this, to do a one-woman show in a church basement, mm -hmm. up through those big seven, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then the next tier was the participating theaters, all those 60 plus theaters that were going to do something for the festival. They each had to provide us, and by us, this was Flanagan, the consultants that were hired, one team member. And that team member was responsible for getting information both into their organization and out of their organization. So it really was, we, we did this with a two person staff mm. and a brilliant, fabulous intern, I think about mentoring. I got one for you, she's brilliant. Um, it didn't take, and with both Jojo and I being executive directors of other organizations, mm -hmm. um, there were times when it was overwhelming and there was a lot, of, and there was a lot of times that it was just get, gathering the information and then putting the information back out. So. We're talking now with the folks in San Francisco. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Oh, there you go. Um, and um, one of the things that we're learning as we think about how you might do this in other places is that you need to have a starting point, mm -hmm. right? So like what they're talking about in San Francisco where they already have a uh, Bay Area, that would be their starting point. That would be their originating theater. So it's like our New York, we have theater theater. Uh, right, so like theater theater. So in the same way we had what we came to lovingly call the OTADs and the OMADs, the originating theater artistic directors and the originating <laughs> theater managing directors, uh, that served as our core, the place that all decisions, not they didn't make all the decisions, but whenever we would run into something that seemed like someone needed to have a say, because ultimately somebody has to be Mm -hmm. The boss, right? Um, so by having the Bay Area, that can serve as that. Also, when you talk about space, those seven originating theaters, every meeting we did, and we did, we met with the OTADs and the OMADs at least once a month. We met with each task force once a month, and we met with the uh, team members from the participating theaters originally once a quarter, and then as we got closer to the festival. It went to bi-monthly and then to monthly, um, and then in those last few weeks, kind of whenever we needed pieces. But it allowed us to create a structure that included all 70 of those theaters. It also allowed the work to actually get done 
both going up and down. Yeah. The, the but what's your lead time is. on the festival? When did you start? Like how long did it take you? Mm -hmm. so it was a, we were brought on at about 20 months. Uh, and there were there they had been working on it for a year in concept before then. Um, the fundraising really happened over the course of about six months, uh, and that fundraising, just so you'll know, that half million dollars we talked about was almost equally distributed between in kind, mostly in advertising, but also in um, some consulting gives and a lot of marketing gives. Uh, and cash, the bulk of the cash came from uh, a grant from the district, uh, Arts and Humanities Council, uh, because they very smartly recognized that. Mm -hmm. The other thing I will encourage you to do is set up two, at least two, probably no more than three, very clear, measurable goals mm. for what you want out of the festival. We were charged with two things. We were charged with making the country aware of the depth and scope of the work being created by women in the United States, mm -hmm. and making the country aware of the depth and scope of the theater scene within Washington, D.C. School goals. <laughs> but, but great, but, but doable, Classic. you know, yeah. but things that were, that we could point to on a, literally on a weekly basis mm -hmm. and say, how is this going? How is this going? How is this going? Uh, we also, very late in the game, too late in the game for, I think, all of us now, uh, hired a PR person. We made uh, a huge difference. Mm -hmm. um, and, but really, with two people, an intern, and another part, two part-time people, an intern, and another part-time consultant. This happens. Mm -hmm. If you were doing it again, would you restrict it to work from your place? Oh, that's such a great question. Yeah. I would not, and I'll tell you why I wouldn't. One, because those of you who know in NPN yeah. know that our Rolling World Premiere program has really kind of changed the face of how theater gets done across the country. Uh, and I feel it's so important to do second and third productions. Mm -hmm. yes. um, secondly, because we found that many of the companies within the 70 companies who did not normally do new work didn't really have the capacity yeah. or understanding to give the playwright the best possible mm -hmm. outing of their play. Uh, we had so many playwrights from across the country who were thrilled they wanted to be a part of the festival and then got there and realized that maybe this company was not mm -hmm. the right company for them. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it was all a positive because the work got done, mm -hmm. and it got out there, and it was seen and heard in those titles, and now, um, if you don't know about this thing, you all need to, uh, this is the New Play Exchange, it's a product of NNPN, uh, it is an online database platform where for $10 a year, any playwright can go in and set up their own uh, uh, profile and upload synopsis, scenes, or samples, or the full play, and then it's searchable. We have 50% women on here already. Uh, it's great if you're an organization, $25 a year, you can go in and put anything in, and if you want to just see plays by women that were done in the Women's Voices Festival, you can do that. If you want to see plays by women about global warming, you can do that. If you want to see plays by women about global warming that require four actors that have never been uh, introduced, and two of those actors need to be like 70 and African American. You can narrow it down literally that far, right? There's um, over 7,000 plays on here already, and we're not at our year anniversary yet. Um, this is actually is. another database issue. We were talking earlier in the day that with the gender parity studies, that the data is being collected in different ways. It yeah. would be great. Just that we kind of agreed that all the people working on parity studies are going to get together and talk Try about their computer stuff. And, all. and databases this, would be another. This is a, a thing that if you, there's no more of that, they're not any plays by women. Yeah. 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 There's yeah. not any right. good right. plays by women. That's bullshit, and we're calling mm. bullshit, and we're showing you how to find them if you don't know where they are. Um, anyway, all of the scripts from the festival are going to go up on the new play exchange, every that's one that's being released, okay. and will be tagged as such, so you can go on and get it. Um, when I talk to the folks at uh, San Francisco and a couple of the other cities, I've said to them, think about having a festival that includes second and third productions, yes. at least, because it's really important, and it'll give the opportunity 
to those theaters that want to participate but for whom new work is... I think it would be easier to sell second and third for a lot of times too, right? That's and great. also, as yeah. Kate's organization was talking about, that they've been gone through, gone through a couple of productions, had the revisions, and they're ready. They're good to go. They're ready. Right, they're good to go. Yeah, good exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I would, I would definitely open that right. door a little more. Right. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of things we would do differently if we were doing it again. And I should say on the if we are doing it again thing, uh, we've had uh, our first two initial post-mortems, one with the OTEDs and OMADs, one with all of the participating theaters. We also are in the midst of a big survey project gathering data about attendance and new buyers and all those kind of things. Uh, so we'll have all of that. We'll be publishing a tiny version of a white paper. Uh, we'll also be putting up on the website of the Women's Voices Theater Festival.org website a, um, a how-to page that explains the structure that I just talked about. Right. So we're hoping to share that. Um, and yeah, it's all coming for you. One other thing that um, one of the women who was involved with you was talking about a couple of weeks ago was that part of the mission, and I thought this was so fabulous, was if people went to a theater, they were really encouraged, go to another play at another theater. Don't just see that one. Or yeah, see I, that's one, one of the theater. things that we didn't do as well as we uh, would like to have. Okay. Um, it, it happened, and it did, and we're, we're seeing those numbers a little bit. But that's something that that's a lesson that we've learned that we'll like to share with whoever's going to do it next. Mm. There is a better way to do it. We did it with a what what was called a festival pass, yeah. where you could just go in and put in a code, and people were to told the code. Uh, but there wasn't a lot of incentive, and we would do it differently. Yeah. Well, I think the other problem, like as a tourist coming to DC to go to the festival, is yes. just where are these places? You know, and I was trying to just figure out which ones are near where I'm staying. So right. I can, mm. I right. can buy the subway or not. Yeah. Yeah. Festival yeah, maps. Just kind of a, yeah. yeah. That, that part was we didn't. Challenge. We did not do a festival app, and I yeah. would definitely do that mm -hmm. right up front because yeah. then you can stand on the street and go, "Wow, well, what's close to me?" Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The things we learned. Can I ask a quick question? You can, uh, yeah, come, come up here, introduce yourself. Come on. I wanted to ask you a question. Yes. Uh, so, the, the new play exchange, yes. which is so exciting, Thank and I'm, you. I'm on there. Um, what is the percentage of those plays that are by women, and how, and uh, the numbers of women playwrights that have submitted online? It's interesting. Our, the number of registered profiles runs right at 50-50. And you know, if we, we look at it five monthly, and uh, you know it'll go to fifty two, and then uh, there's a, always, of course, there's a percentage of unidentified, and there's a percentage uh, that identifies non-binary. Uh, but for the most part, the men women number of profiles sits about the same. Men are putting up more plays, right? And we're we're looking at it. We're one of the things we have very detailed data that's coming out of the new play exchange, and we're going to be able to really give you some great figures about new work and how it's being done and happening. Uh, but one of the things that we're learning is that men will put a hot mess up, uh, right? <laughs> men, men will put a play up before they feel it's finished. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Men will put up plays that say, I'm working on this play, I think this is, I really want to let somebody work on it with me, oh my God. I want to do it. Women tend to hold on to their work and not put it up until, and this is my own theory based That's on the numbers that we're seeing. Um, it's something we're going to try to tease out over the course of a couple of years maybe. But uh, yeah, men are putting up more plays. There's an equal number of men and women, but men are putting up more plays. That's for very well. So, so put your plays up there. They don't care which one they do. Good. I would love to talk to you because I have a funny feeling that out of this we might be able to actually. Cr I'm not going to do the festival, <laughs> but, uh, but I have a feeling between all of us. I think it's something that we can do. Yeah, absolutely, so that could be a yes. positive yes. today. But yes. what I can say, and I want to preface it with, please join works by women, and there's a specific reason for that. Um, we do list the productions that are 50-50 in writer, director, designer. So that means, what I'm actually saying is, if, we, if this festival happens, I think we'd be the perfect organization to actually list 
the place. And so ah, there's a structure already works. in place. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also in terms of putting the, the festival together, I think we also have the infrastructure in terms of the designers, the writers, the directors. We really have hundreds of those names on a database. We also have, and I'm not saying everybody, because I won't say that, we have, that we're perfect, because we're not. We're trying to collect the information which is what I think is so important. You know, how do you know which show to go and see, right? Put your money where your mouth is, if you don't know which shows qualify. So that's part of why we were organized in the first place. But the point is that if people start submitting, if we can train audiences to make a choice and to be discerning, and if we can start looking at ourselves as industry people to go and look at those web, at the website and say, who do I hire? Oh, and by the way, I've got 10 more designers that aren't on your bloody website. Why yeah. aren't they on there? I'm like, don't shoot me. Let's just put them on there. Yeah. We don't yeah. argue. Let's just add yeah. them. You know, we're not trying to resist. We just don't have all the information. Right. But more importantly, which I think is something that people don't know about us enough, unfortunately, is that we also have a resource, which is all the initiatives. You know, On Her Shoulders is on there. History Matters, Back to the Future. You know, the League of Professional Theatre Women. You know, Women Arts. I mean, there's a huge resource of everyone that's out there. Well, no, again, I shouldn't say everyone. A lot of us that are out there. Mm -hmm. So I think between all of us, I think we can manage it. And the piece that I'm offering from Works by Women is to be a hub in terms of organisation and in terms of getting the word out there. Well, maybe organization is not the right word. It's more about database. It's more about information. So information, and so anybody who wants to reach out to us and say, you know, we're not on there, or did you know about so-and-so, or how about this design of fabulous, please, works by women, not all. So that's kind of what I wanted to say, because I know we're all getting up, I can feel the energy is like going, because <laughs> we're exhausted, right? Yeah, it's going to be a long day. It's going to be a long day. Are we running out of time? Yeah. I don't know if we're running out of time. I know. Wait, what? Five more minutes? Okay. I'll go away. Okay, good. Now she'll come up. <laughs> and introduce herself and everything. Hi, I'm Arlene Hutton, I'm a freelance playwright. Um, and it's been so exciting hearing all this about all the organizational work. But I want to remind us of what somebody said earlier about the individual reaching out and mentorship. There are several women here who have been important in my life in mentoring. And um, don't dismiss the power of what one person can do just reaching out to one other person. Mm -hmm. um, when I was on the faculty at the College of Charleston two years ago, they put in place a season that was all men, and I raised a big fuss. <laughs> and the next season, they did all women. <laughs> I reached it when. Uh, when the South Carolina State Legislators uh, banned the Campus Reads program because of the book Fun Home, I reached out to Janine Tesori and Lisa Crone and producer Barbara Whitman, and they brought down the entire production of Fun Home to the College of Charleston <gasps> um, uh, a week uh, after it was nominated for the Pulitzer. And I want to leave you with uh, a quote from, uh, from Emma. Little Emma's 10 years old, and she was in my playwriting class mm -hmm. in the group. And we did uh, an exercise where we talked about what we want to write about, about themes, about what's important to us. And we all went around the room and talked about that and wrote uh, little lists and stuff. And then we were, that was leading into an exercise um, where they were going to write a scene. And as they start to write, little Emma looks up at me and she says, when did women get equal rights? And I looked at her, and it just came out of my mouth, and I said, they haven't yet. <laughs> and she said, really? And I said, do you mean when did women get the right to vote? She goes, oh, well, yes, when did that happen? And I, and I told her. And she said, but they don't have equal rights. And I go, not yet, Emma. So on behalf of Emma, I want to thank all of you for what you're doing here. I just want to address the, the issue of the fact that, you know, except for that, 
um, that, that we're all white women in this, uh, maybe some variation of white women, but still mm -hmm. we're all white women. There's an enormous number of, of women of color working in theater in this town. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I know that, and, the, if you try to and they just them. don't know this is happening. Yeah, well, they're not on our lists. Yeah, they are. Uh, they're, well, they may well be, but I, I know many of them, because we work with them at New Perspectives, and they usually don't know that it's happening. So okay. I think there we have to make a, a, a serious to um, effort when we talk about databases is that we have to, and also we have to say this is for you. You are not a token, yes. we're not yeah, asking you because absolutely. we think we need you for funding, but you are a part of the equation absolutely. and you must, must, must come. And I think we just need to do a better job. Of that. I agree with you completely. But I don't want you to think that we did not, there, this is how it played out as true with them. But there were many, there were, for every person who came, there were three who were invited. And, uh, yeah, do you want to come back up? And then we're going to finish. Oh, okay, talk. Very uh, quickly. In my, the uh, League of Special Theater, whose uh, uh, playwrights group meets in that apartment, we have five members, two of them are black. And they are as good at writing as the white women. They're very good writers. So, they're there. Um, yeah. Should I say something really yeah. fast? Yeah. Yeah. No, just, just, uh, just, if you teach in a college, all right, I love that commitment because I know I am committed in all of my classes. I have 150 students, which is overwhelming, mm -hmm. but I do teach Diana Son. I teach a lot of different mm -hmm. contemporary mm -hmm. playwrights, and I draw them from various sources, but they have to know that this is available to them. And the perspectives, it's happening in New York. It doesn't have to be, you know, New York, but this is what's happening, and it's really college professors. That it, that's the think tank for the future. So if you work at a college, make a commitment to that. <laughs> so and obviously we could talk for hours and hours, but we also all are exhausted, particularly those of us who were here all day. I just want to, at this point, thank you all for coming. Thank everyone who participated this entire day, which was amazing. Thank our Canadian friends who started this conversation. <laughs> Absolutely.